afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us for this week's Armour Seminar. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the Field Museum resides on the ancestral lands of the uh, Fire Nation Confederacy, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. Uh, it is gr with great pleasure that I am announcing uh, today's speaker, who is a postdoctoral researcher in my lab. Uh, Bei Chen Kuo did his undergraduate degree at the National Taiwan University, where he graduated in 2015 with a double major in geology and anthropology, followed by a master's in geosciences at the University of Edinburgh with Chicago's own Steve Brusati. Uh, in 2019, in which he worked on archosaur jaw mechanics. And then he did his PhD in Cambridge with his beloved advisor, Dan Field, whose shoes I'm never going to be able to fill. And, uh, uh, and he did uh, his PhD research on the avian quadrate, which he's going to tell us about today. And Pei Chen joined us this fall as, uh, as the geology John Caldwell Meeker postdoc, and he has been a huge help to me as we've been working on our precious bird. And uh, since Pei Chen will be with us for basically the next two years, I encourage you to introduce yourself. Uh, on a personal note, uh, even though he is a bird nerd, his favorite animal is a capybara. So Pei Chen, everyone. Thank you, Jingmei. So today I'm going to share my result from my PhD thesis. I will share joy instead of pain, because I know sometimes it's quite painful. So, so what is a bird? If you talk to Americans, the first idea will jump in their mind is a bald eagle. And I just found that American is so obsessed with bald eagle, we can basically found everywhere, like from Department of State, which is who, who offer my visa, and also from IRS, who requires tax filing. And if you are if you are same, like same generation as mine, then probably well found that the birds you are linked to Pokemon or Angry Bird. I know it's like kind of dying phone game, but yeah. <laughs> so what's special to birds? People say that birds can fly. Yes, most of birds can fly. And the flying abilities help them to become the X predator to like, they don't have to like uh, have the competitions with the land animals that could like uh, expand their own eco, like eco space. Some of the birds couldn't fly, but they're good at running like ostrich. And some birds, they couldn't fly, they couldn't run, well, couldn't properly run, but they decide to fly in the ocean, like penguins and booby, who is good at diving. And some birds have to uh, adapt to different kind of uh, different type of shape to adapt different food source, like hummingbirds and flamingo. So most people study birds; uh, they are really interested in like how the flying help them to become the uh, successful um, uh, animals. And, but I'm um, particularly interested in their skull, in their cranium. So then what goes to the second question? What is the quadrate? Well, quadrate is a, very, a tiny bone um, in connect with the cranium and lower jaw. And here we have the examples of the malurus. And the quadrate is colored in the red-ish just over there. And here is the, like, the, different, uh, the quadrate from different angles. And I didn't mention the like, I didn't put the scale bar there, but you can just imagine like, how tiny the quadrant is. But actually, it's very important, especially for birds. You can also find the quadrant in other in other animals like crocodiles, dinosaurs, squamate, and for humans and other mammals, this bone has been evolved to uh, another bone called incus, which help uh, mammals uh, in their hearing. So why it is important? First of all, there's a lot of uh, cranial muscle attached on quadrate, and they help them to transfer, uh, transfer the stress and open and close the beak. And most important, and, and the, the blue arrows point out is the muscle attached on the quadrate. And the most important thing is quite quadrate play a key role in, in cranial kinesis. 
Here is an example from YouTube channel uh, with Merlab. And you can see how the quadrant push forward and open a beak. So when quadrant push forward through the, the rest of the, the skull, like the jugal and the pterygoids, it can open the beak. And can also like transfer the stress from the muscle attached on it through these two push rod and to the, the, to the rostral of the beak. And on the other hand, they can also transfer the stress from the beak back to the skull. And most important thing is, the, the bird quadrant exhibits a huge amount of uh, morphological variations, but this variation has been overlooked for decades and it has been explored quantitatively. So that's why I decided to study the shape of the quadrant to try to solve out how the birds evolve like how the ancestor, like how the ancestor of mon, modern bird evolved, like this kind of this uh, diversity. You may notice that the so the animals, uh, the animal which uh, the cattle tiger stand on, standing on, is one of my favorite animal, capybara. It is the biggest me with capybara. So the next question goes to how to study shape. Shape is always a very tricky thing because it has a lot of factors what influence your result, like size, um, positions, and orientation. And it took me a, a while to think about how to give the, a clear example. And let me introduce one of the famous yellow moths in the world, Pikachu. So at the beginning, in like 19, 1997, Pikachu is quite chunky, fat, but suddenly something happens in recently, like Pikachu become very slender and slender. It seems like they seems that Pikachu are successful in like go on diet. But and then in the, the couple of bef like generation before, Pikachu become giant again and very chunky. And in last uh, generation, Pikachu become crystallized. So if we so if we didn't put the size, if, if we didn't standardize the size, then the most variable, uh, what we see, what, what we have seen from these Pikachus is definitely size. Size will control what you have already seen it. So we must to solve or fix these problems. And how to fix this? So we're gonna use what the, some, uh, what the, the, the methods called landmark. So landmark is, um, we try to capture the shape variations um, of the homology characters or the characters like uh, all share in all the specimen you have, or for instance, all, this, all, all the, the, the characters that all these Pikachu have. And we put like the, a, a point on it. So we can start like, okay, we can put one landmarks on Pikachu's right ear right yes right ear and left ear and maybe put on the check like this so we can try somehow to quantify the width of their face and then we can do this for other pikachu like this and landmark can also help us to quantify the curve or the outline it's called curve lamp sending landmarks and basically we quantify the shape of the line that let's say we quantify like we'll put landmarks on Pikachu's tail, then we can do the shape variation of this, uh, these characters. And this landmark-based uh, shape analysis has been called geometry morphometry analysis. So we apply these methods to study the shape of the bird quadrant. And we use landmarks to capture the shape variation of uh, the bird quadrant characters. So we focus on the first, the, the outline shape of the quadrant. Second, the muscle attachment, and third, the shape of the articulation surface. And since we got this huge amount of the shape matrix, we input into R to run the procrastis analysis, helping us to remove the effect from size, orientation, and position. And later, we use principal component analysis to visualize the most variable features. And with this, um, and in my PhD thesis, we examined 200 bird quadrant, which is quite a bit insane. So we want, to answer, we want to answer two questions. So the first question is, what causes the shape variation of bird quadrant? Basically, we want to ask is, 
what kind of the 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 what is the is there any eco ecological information relative to the shape of the quadrate or how this being built by uh, other factor like behave or sort of things and the second one is how might the ancestor of bird, modern bird quadrate look like and basically what to ask is What's the difference between the and the like the the extent uh, extinct species and extinct species in bird quadrate, and we try to understand how the mountain bird quadrate become, um, how the mountain bird quadrate become what we have received nowadays. So go for the first question, then we gonna run the uh, we gonna run the analysis called ecomorphology analysis. So we use phylo, phylogenetic generalized least generalized least square to examine different kind of uh, ecology informations to see if there's any correlations with the shape variation of bird quadrant. So those ecology information has been uh, obtained from the previous study, uh, like Avnant and Elton Trans data set, and then we can. Later, we use the, also uh, use this uh, shape variation to test the integrations with the bird quadrate and the neighboring bone with the data set from the Okne et al. 2021, since we are using the same data set. So here is the morphospace space of PC1, PC2, and PC1, PC3. So the color here represents the, the different phylogenetic groups of, the, of birds. And so, Generally speaking, you can see that uh, in PC1, we can separate the red ish and non the red ish. So the red ish means uh, the red ish quadrate represents the, the, the group called gallophone and acerophone, which is duck like, duck like bird and chicken like birds. And then we use this matrix um, to run the PGRS, uh, PGRS to test the correlations. So we test. The like the correlation between size, phylogenetic groups, diet, habit, and big uh, big function, and then we realize that only size and phylogeny have a, a signif significant correlations with the shape of the quadrant. None of the ecology information we have in get involved in this study is tested significantly, which is a bit upset, disappointed, but probably makes sense. And we took the like some example to so importantly tell us that the the relationship between quadrate and like the diet or ecology is not always goes to one to one relationship. So here we go. We took the example of dark quadrate. So as you can see, that the dark quadrate is um, shared the similar uh, morpho space uh, as shown on here. So that means that they look similar to each other. But you can also tell that dog have uh, varies uh, in their territory. Like some dogs could eat fish, some and most of dogs eat like organic and invertebrates. So it tells us that quadrate with similar shape could have multiple territories. It is not guaranteed that one specific shape of the quadrate have to uh, could only have one that one kind of dietary, and also, and also the same with the 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 dietary and the shape. So here is another example, and this is one of the result of our PGLS result. And x axis represent the different uh, different dietary, and y axis represent the value of y axis represent the shape variation of the bird quadrant. And here we took the example, the neck eater. So in our study, in our data set, we have hummingbirds and we have indicators and the nectoraptors. And as you can see, they share similar X value. That means that they are all kind of like nectar, neck eater, but with different Y value. That means that they, ha they, ha they are having different kind of different type of shape of quadrant. And here, here is how their quadrant looks like. And so based on our PGRS result, we can jump to we can jump into two conclusions. The shape variation of bird quadrates appears to be more influenced by phylogeny. 
and different avian lineage across the tree exhibit different correlations between quadrate shape and clay specific along the tree. And finally, we test the integrations between the quadrate and the neighboring bone, and also the, quad, the different portion of quadrate itself. So we found that the different portion of quadrate itself is significantly integrated with each other. And also the same, uh, we can also see the similar relationship happens in quad between quadrate and the neighboring bone, but it's, it's much weaker than the different portion of the quadrate itself. So in our conclusion, so the shape of the bird, variation of bird quadrate is significantly influenced by phylogeny. With different avian lineage across the tree, a curate different quadrate shape and click specific along the tree. And our PGLS result also support the notion that quadrate in birds evolved as a coherent unit with the kinetic system of avian quadrate, as indicated by the stronger covariation of the region within this element than with the adjunct scatum. If we take these two conclusions together, maybe our results potentially give us that uh, a good, uh, uh, exciting opportunity for using quadrate shape to place isolate fossil avian quadrate in a phylogeny context under quantitative framework. So this paper has been published just two weeks ago, exactly two weeks ago, with my um, my my colleague from Cambridge, like um, Guillermo, and my co-supervisor, Roger, and my lovely supervisor, Dan Daniel. And goes to the second question, how might the essence of bird quadrant looks like? Then we decide to, since we have, since we're being tired of like 200 quadrants are too much, then this time we mainly focus on a specific group, specific group called Gavanseri, which include the chicken-like bird and duck-like bird. And again, we use the uh, we use this, the geometric model major analysis to visual uh, to capture the shear variation of their quadrate and run and run the principal component analysis to visualize the shear variations. And also, we apply the phylogeny tree. Then we can help us to see the patterns or the transitions of the this shape changings. So that is called phylomorphosphy. I know it's a very complicated here. Right now, I try to make it easier. And in this plot, the greenish point represent galophon, which is chicken-like bird, and the blueish point represent the acer and seraphon, which is dog-like bird. And our and phy phylomorphosphy help help us to understand what the ancestral condition might look like. And this great, uh, this great point represents the ancestral of Galangseri. So with this point, and this point could, could and this point is rep, uh, this point represents the shape matrix, shape matrix or lemma matrix of the ancestral condition. And use this matrix, and with the average shape matrix, we can try somehow to shaping the ancestral state of Galangseri quadrate. And people call it essential reconstruction, but I love to call it Play-Doh time because it's like the clay you are like shaping whatever you like. And this is the result. And as you can see, it's quite, yeah, we got this and we're like, okay, now it looks nice. But next step is what if adding fossils in our data set? Since Galangsari uh, have already uh, found a lot of uh, uh, fossil record, like Asteronis and Conflito and classic Prisbionis. So we decide to add this uh, data in our data set to see what's going on. And again, this is a phylomorphic space. And this time, the essential conditions significantly shift to this point. So right now, we expect that, okay, they might look quite different from our previous result. And this is our result. It looks like it's quite different than what we have already um, done for the first time. And we can easily compare the different models with the modern, modern species from the dorsal, lateral, and ventral view. And as you can see, uh, we found that the, the reconstruction without fossils may have shared 
the similar like the main share the associations with the characters in the between the mod the galophone and the server phone. Like the orbital process of the reconstructions with our fossils looks like the shape of the orbital process looks like the ancestral form, but the tips of this uh, process is more similar than the galophone, which is chicken-like bird. And here, what we call quadratujugal cotyle. This cotyle is uh, as deeper as the ancestral form, which is dark like dark like bird. But the optic process, which articulate with the cranium, is more similar than the than the chicken-like bird. And then, if we compare the results with fossil records like Astroonis and Prisbeonis, we found that maybe the reconstruction with our fossils might be strongly influenced, or maybe have a strong bias. And what we have to say here, the reconstruction without fossils might be just the result of average shape of the data set. Here is the example. So this is what we call pterygoid condyle. In the, in the construction without fossils, it's quite protruding. You can see a clear process or a clear articulate, articulate surface over there. But in the reconstruction, include fossils. And with two fossil records, it's quite blunt. And same happens on the quadratujugal cotyle. In the reconstructions without fossils, it's quite shallow, but uh, include the once include the uh, fossils, it's quite deep, relatively deep and narrow, which is more like Asteronis and Prisbeonis. And based on the com uh, comparisons, we can jump in these two conclusions. Our results suggest the quadrant of ancestral galaxy based on the mountain bird may have shared features associated with extend galophone and ancestral And we strongly encourage adding fossil taxas into three dimension geometric morphometric analysis for ancestral state reconstruction when possible. And we also have been published this uh, th uh, this before. And, and if you are interested in chicken and dark light bird quadrant, then you can read it and here is like quite like a kind of a fancy morphy animation there you can see like how the 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 reconstruction without fossil shape like uh, shaping to the reconstruction with the fossil and so today take home message is the avian quadrant is the weirdest bone in bird scatter and the shape variation of bird quadrant is significantly influenced by phylogeny and it evolved as a coherent unit within the kinetic system of avian birds. Oh, avian birds? Okay. We strongly encourage adding fossil taxa into three dimension, three dimension geometry model matrix data set for ancestral state reconstruction. And for my future works, and um, this is also one of the reasons I apply the postdoc with Jing Mei and come to a film museum. So I want to run the disparity analysis to examine rates of morphological changes in quadrate through the bird evolution history. And to do this, we have to get to data sets. The first is time calibrated phylogeny framework. Luckily, we have a lot of data based on coming from the DNA sequencing. And the second data is always goes to fossils because we have found that there's a huge gap between the extinct species and, extinct and modern birds. Here we took the owls as an example. As you can see here in the modern, in the modern species, which is the, 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 the below two one, you can, as you can see that they are like the uh, elongate process over there. It can also, go, it's almost become the process. Um, but in the extended one, it's quite blunt. It, it doesn't look like the broken or anything else. And another significant difference is over there. So in modern hours, they have a huge opening for the air, air sac system. But in the extinct species, there's nothing, just like the depressions over there. So we have really known that there's a huge difference between the 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 like the, the extinct species and the modern species. So when we run the disparity analysis, 
maybe we it's better to adding more fossil records to help us to get the more precise uh, data, precise result. And so this is one of the the specimen I'm working on. We just uh, sent to to the CT scan last week, and this is how it looks like. So maybe you can notice that the quadrate is oh, this point. The quadrate is over there. Yeah, over there, and here you can see the CT scan. So we can see that. So I really do some like prim, prim, primary work, primary blah blah. Preliminary works, and something quite fantastic is at the back of the the, the fossil we found another quadrate, and maybe there's like broken part of the quadrate. So, is so it's possible that we can like fix this and to build the models of this bird. And another future work is we also hope to wind the sampling. It could also include the to the different landmarks on different on the territory and palatines, which is uh, also important in the bird kin uh, in bird kinesis. And also, we might also interesting in include the Mesozoic stem groups. Here is uh, another bird, another number, another fossil. So I'm working on called uh, Sapiornis. So from previous study, they labeled some of the characters on it. But when I do the segmentation, I found that maybe the labels from the, the original papers got wrong. So this is what I have done. And when we turn it back, we also find some different bone, like the, the, the tiny bone over there in purple is called hyoid, which is uh, we couldn't have found it if we didn't use the CT scan. And so if anyone is interested in like studying shape, then I'm happy to help you guys. And if anyone's particularly interested in study of Capybara, I'm also I'm volunteer. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Have you looked at terror birds by any chance? And Sar and Sariamids are close living relatives. Sorry. Have you, have you looked at the, this bone on terror birds or Sariamids? Ah, um, uh, that well goes for the disparity analysis. We already got the three D model of those those you got it? and it looks completely different from the Karima. Oh. So it's very interesting. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Peyton, I was uh, curious, when you when you add the fossils into your uh, shape analysis, yeah. are those weighted differently than the modern taxa? Like, uh, I mean, how, yeah, because they're technically closer to the ancestral condition being much older, especially Asteriornis being, you know, 66 million years old. So it, 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 does this analysis take that factor that in? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think we weight the importance of the fossils. Um, it's not we weight. It's like we treat it at, we treat it equal. Like uh, maybe this can answer your question. Okay, let's go to the supplementary. So we also do different type, different kind of phylogeny tree since the phylogeny condition of some of the, the, the taxa is unstable. So here is our result. We choose like the, with three fossils and, and so the yellowish, yellowish diamond represent the shape, uh, represent the results only based on two fossils and the uh, three fossils. And the the light blue each represent the two fossils only. So it might tell us that it, it doesn't matter like how many fossils they are, but they definitely shift all the ancestral condition. And we somehow, uh, not we somehow, we tr uh, we also try to project the ancestral of Gallonsari without fossils into phylomorphospay 
in this data set. And that is the, the reddish diamond over there. So it's clearly showing that they are very different. Hey, Pichu, very nice talk. And I relate a lot with this shape analysis because I did a lot in my postdoc too. Ooh. So one thing, answer the Jim made questions about, you can scale the tree to reflect the different age of the fossil. Yeah. So that might help you to get, like, to take in consideration the different age for the fossil compared to the living species. Mm -hmm. I can show you, it's not so complicated. Yeah, thank you. But one thing I was curious is about the, I still didn't get the function of this quadrate. Oh, okay. that's fact. Because I was surprised to see, like, and based on the question of the function, my another question is how is the variation within specifically groups? Oh my God. <laughs> mm. I have to say, this, uh, this is very good questions, but so far we need the bio biology experiment data, which is still in links, because we we have known that the quadrant is important in like cranial cranial kinesis, but the problem is no one has been tested, like uh, uh, no one has been to uh, show that how to quantify the like the how the biomechanics difference in. Um, from the different like bird species. So if we got more data, like how if there's any uh, influ like in think how if there's any like shape is really influ in influencing in the like the the strength transfer, then maybe help us. But unfortunately we don't have that so far. Maybe it's like another future project like cooperate with other people. Yeah, I think it would be nice because you already have so many spaces yeah. for this function to explore more, like, beyond the phylogeny, right? What you could try to figure out based on the shape of different groups or within group variation. For example, I was thinking about specialization within birds. If birds that, like, clades of birds that are more specialized for either a habitat or specific kind of diet, they will have a more restricted variation than those birds who has a more generalized diet or mm. habitat. We have a more variation. Oh. So this could tell you if the quadrate is related or not to this, to a possible function. Yeah, maybe there is another way. Like uh, like for parrots, uh, as you can see, the, par the, the articulation with lower jaw has been evolved like the, like, like the only one condyle. I, what I thought is maybe that is explain why the parrot have more like like have, is very powerful when then like cracking or like biting uh, this behave but the problem is that it's not much um like quant like quantified data has been reported yeah. uh, oh yes so para is like very distinct. If like someone just like threw a lot of quadrate and I can easily identify which one is Paris quadrate. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> yeah, probably not, but maybe so this also like um, we also like discuss this in the uh, we also discuss with my colleague, my previous colleague, and maybe the reason why the phylogeny is so significant in our data set is because we took like as a, like a macro evolution view, but if we narrow it down to micro, like we just maybe we take we, maybe we took like one family leveled, then maybe the shape of the quadrant might tell us the difference between their diet. And we also proved that in, uh, I think we have been proved that is true in the dark quadrant. So the, the shape of the dark quadrant is actually correlated with some of the ecology and it's like tell us like 20% of the shape variation, which is very significant than any others.
Any last questions? So given how these quadrates are pretty obvious between taxa, can it be used as identifiers? Like if you found a bird, if you found a bird bone, a quadrate, a random quadrate, would you be able to tell what kind of bird came from? Came from or like location or like groups? Look, um, group, taxonomic groups. Ah, uh, yes, we can do that. So th I think also that's why uh, when I uh, when I examined uh, like the the scoring characters from previous publication, they list a lot of characters on quadrate, and some of the characters has been proved that they are the synapomorphic, or in some specific groups, which is the shared characters in the specific group, like the the chickens and. Penguins and parrots, for sure. Hmm. Neat. Hi, uh, we're the contingency of lay people in your audience, and so um, take my question with a grain of salt, but I'm interested to know if there are any social influences that you saw represented either by gender or by age. Uh, specifically, is there um, traditional tasks that a one a, a male would perform versus a female that would cause differences in the quadrate. Okay, um, gender probably doesn't have strongly influence, but age actually did. So what I found is in so in our one of the data sets we show uh, so in one of the the species called osprey. So in our data set, the osprey show is uh, osprey is a enigmatic quadrate, which is there's no any opening for the air sac system. But when I checked the specimen here, like check other specimen here, and we found that um, a lot of them actually have the opening. So it might tell us that uh, the specimen in our data actually is juvenile, and that's why they only so that's why they only have like a uh, like the depressions over there and the air cell haven't been like advanced into the quadrant body, then it also maybe happens uh, when they become an adult one. And also this other like study show, uh, uh, look at the embryo of Pika Pika, which is magpie and magpie, yes, magpie and the Austrian. And they also found that the shape of the quadrant is significant changing through time. So aging definitely have the the influence on the shape. Any last questions? Going once, going twice. All right, thanks, Pei Chen. Thank you.